you all. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Kate Simmons and I am here um, as part of the Science and Society um, section. Um, I am the Art and Science Track Lead as part of the Science and Society section. Um, and this is our first Science and Society Dialogue session, and we are really excited to have you all here. Um, a reminder for those who are not um, used to Zoom, which is um, few and far between these days, but um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, this will be recorded. Um, please mute yourself during the speak. The, the speakers will be taking questions in the chat um, and we can call on you if you have a burning question um, as well. So that will be towards the end of the session time. All right, I'm gonna get started um, just sharing a little bit about the Science and Society section. So as part of the AGU strategic plan, they have several goals that relate to science and society, um, looking at solutions to both scientific and societal challenges, making sure that scientific culture is inclusive, and partnering broadly with organizations and sector, sectors in order to address those challenges. So the science and society section is relatively new. It got its new name um, a couple of years ago, and we've been trying to grow the section and generate more interest um, over the past several years. And these are just an outline of our goals for this section is really to serve as a place within AGU for those who span across multiple disciplines um, and have a, this welcoming community for decision makers and practitioners who want to engage with the scientific community, um, as well as promote uh, diversity and make sure that those who are underrepresented in science have a place and, and can get support, and then provide um, meaningful cross-disciplinary collaborations and learning opportunities, and of course, share with all of you. We have five tracks, art and science, community and citizen science, science communication, science policy, and social and behavioral sciences. And we all have sessions for this upcoming AGU fall meeting. We usually do that every year. And we're trying out something new by having these webinars um, in the time between AGU fall meetings. We have a wonderful website that one of our members, Chris, has put together. So please snap that with your phone or check it out. Um, we'll put a link in the chat as well to our our website, it has lots of really great information about how you can get engaged with us, um, connect with us on social media. If you wanna be a section member, if you wanna volunteer or share your story or just please check it out. It's a really great website and it has a lot of really good information. And then as I mentioned at the beginning, this is one of five. So please register for our other sessions. Um, Julie, who is our president, the our section president is gonna put these in the chat, but please join us. Um, they're always at 2 p.m. Eastern time on, on Tuesdays going forward into the fall. So these should all be really awesome and we'd love to see you there. And then importantly, we have a open call for anybody interested in submitting to a virtual exhibition that we're going to have during the fall meeting. So even if you are not an AGU member, we are welcoming submissions for works that speak to the integration of art and science. Um, and we'll, we're going to have someone talk a little bit more about that in a second. But there is, I'm going to put in the chat um, right now, Sorry for all of the links in the chat, but um, this is um, the one that I just put in is the form to submit your interest in participating as part of this virtual art show that will that coincide with the AGU fall meeting. And some of the pieces may be featured as part of plenary sessions during 
the AGU fall meeting, so it's a great opportunity. And we have a couple of other things in the works. We are hoping to have an in-person exhibition at the conference center that Nika Tosca and Sarah Rosengard are, are working on. And um, we're gonna have a, a plenary session and some other really great events going forward. If you are interested in art and science, just keep your eyes out for that. Um, and then I'll, I'll plug that we do have a science and society um, session that you can submit an abstract to and with that i'm going to actually turn it over to introduce um oops sorry hold on i just want to double check one thing yes i'm going to turn it over to mika to talk a little bit more about well what is art and science and what does that mean <laughs> So go for it, Mika, and then we'll introduce our speakers. Okay, great, awesome, thank you. Um, so I actually, uh, we'll just quickly share a few quick slides. Many of you who who know me know that uh, the work I do um, operates right at the intersection um, of art and science. And so I'm an associate professor, uh, recently tenured at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm a climate scientist by training. Um, I work at the intersection of art and scientists, science with, with young artists and young scientists. And one of the reasons why I believe there's an important role for art in, in, in discussing, you know, how, how it can help us as we tackle these sort of big environmental issues is, for one example, climate change is an abstracted object known as a hyper object. And so while we all encounter these big abstracted objects in our work, artists and designers in particular intelligently address abstraction every day. And so there's a very didactic role for art um, which is epitomized by sort of these paintings by Diane Burka, which were recently um, on display at the American Museum. Um, but there's also, I argue, a role for art and design that can uh, go beyond the improved communication and actually um, help, uh, art can, can play a role in helping us sort of construct scientific uh, knowledge itself. So art is useful uh, for both communicating difficult, complex scientific concepts and also for actually ascertaining uh, difficult and complex scientific knowledge. Um, this is the sort of proposed uh, relationship between, for example, human design processes and simplified scientific method. You can see that they're uh, mostly analogous except for this initial step uh, that artists and designers often include far more than art than uh, scientists. And that step is understanding empathizing, right? listening, learning from stakeholders. Um, and so uh, I wrote about this in a paper last summer, and I just wanted to read one of the one of the quotes. Octavia Butler, who is a, a well-known science fiction writer, often posits in her public speeches that science fiction and I guess more broadly art. Um, is not only about the problems of the world, but also about solving the problems of the world, which if you expand this sentiment to include the broader art world, suggests a very important role for art in confronting the urgency uh, of climate change. And so I'm really excited uh, to kick off this panel with two um, really fantastic uh, artists and, and folks who are thinking about this intersection of art and science. And I wanna leave you with this hopefully optimistic quote from Parable of the Sower as to why we need art um, and why we need specifically to imagine futures that are optimistic, that make us want to live there. Um, the world is full of painful stories. Sometimes it seems as though there aren't any other kind. And yet I found myself thinking how beautiful that glint of water was through the trees. So with that said, um, I will now, hopefully it didn't take up too much time, and I will now turn it over to uh, our um, esteemed panelists who are going to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. My name is Sarah Black. Um, I live and work in Chicago. I'm a professor of sculpture at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, currently chair of the department, um, have uh, been teaching there for some time. And my, my work and my teaching are all involved around the intersection of art and science. Of course, uh, sculpture is my field and sculpture is a wonderfully sort of material inquiry and that has given my students and I an opportunity to really explore 
at the intersection of art and science. So two areas that I teach within, um, one is called the Knowledge Lab. And um, the Knowledge Lab is a place, but also sort of a methodology. And what we think about there is that we want to teach not the answers, but we want to teach the questions. And what we're hoping is that uh, we can begin to ask some of the really challenging questions that we are facing in this era of climate crisis and um, sort of uh, the you know questions around the material cycle and such. And so we have as part of the knowledge lab, um, a living laboratory, which is basically like an outdoor courtyard area where we can we can experiment with growing plants and experimenting with different uh, sort of ecosystem scenarios. We also are working on developing a um, sort of material invention lab. So so that's one area where we're going to you know play around with like say mycelium production, etc. Um, without going on too long, the um, I'm, so I work as part of, of Deep Time Chicago, which is an artist collective uh, in Chicago. I'll share a lot more in my little presentation. I also work with, with another artist, Amber Ginsberg. We've been working collaboratively for about 10 years now. And um, I also work with a group called Project Fielding, which is, which is actually a little bit distinct. Um, we teach woodworking and uh, sort of collaborative building processes to uh, female identified femme uh, women and and children so uh, that's kind of the work that I do in the world and we are um, I'm just very excited to be here so looking forward to presenting a little bit more about my work passing it over to Colin hello I'm Colin Malloy I'm a uh, I'm a PhD student in music and computer science at University of Victoria in Victoria BC where um, so I'm studying basically music technology and the steel pan. And so this summer, I'm the artist in residence for Ocean Networks Canada, where um, I, I'll present the work that kind of led to me being selected as the artist in residence. But um, so I'm creating works that are inspired by the relationship between the oil industry and the, uh, the oceans. And I'll explain that relationship or my how I came about that. My, perspective on the relationship um, in a few minutes. Um, but so I so I mostly teach uh, music technology, programming, uh, audio uh, technology, and then computer science. And so I am a scientist myself. I have a background in mathematics and data science, but I'm definitely not a geophysicist. So I have um, like the, the mathematical workings for what goes on in this kind of things, but also the uh, artistic, because I've also have a background as a professional performer in years past as a percussionist. And uh, so now I'm kind of synthesizing those two worlds in a new way to create new, explore new ways of making sounds through technology, as well as um, now applying that specifically with some projects towards uh, the, the environments and the oceans. So um, great, think... thank you so much. Um, we are really excited to have both Colin and Sarah. Um, so the next um, part of the, the program, we're gonna have each of the speakers go into a little bit more detail and show some of their work, which is gonna be fun. Um, and after they, they speak for about 10, um, 12 minutes, we're gonna have the audience, all of you, actually participate in something. So we are, we're gonna wanna do a word cloud of your responses to their work, to what they are speaking about. Um, and we're gonna ask you to just put those words in the chat and then we're going to collect them all and, and we'll show that and and talk a little bit have a, a short discussion after that um, after each one speaks so to get started um, Sarah would you like to um, share your screen and, and show us our, your wonderful work absolutely okay I'm going to go in and share my screen and you'll see me go into the presenter view unfortunately you still see the the tab of my um screen apologies for that um too too fast to turn it around so i'm going to go ahead and and go into the presentation okay 
Okay. I'm not on slide one. Let me go up to the top. There we go. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Great. Yes, it looks great. Awesome. So good afternoon. I'm really honored to be here today. This is such an important, such an important topic. So it, it means a lot to be here. What I'm going to do is provide a, a quick glimpse into the area of my work that that has had the richest interface with the sciences. Um, I'm a member of a 15 person collective called Deep Time Chicago, and we do a lot of different things. We do walking tours, reading groups, exhibitions, and all of this is with the intention of creating awareness around the Anthropocene. So culture, cultural change in the Anthropocene, understanding that until we have a change in the ways that we think and feel about climate, the climate crisis in the Anthropocene, um, we can't expect a whole lot of change. So Deep Time, the, or the collective, participated in a large-scale project that was organized originally by the Berlin-based House of World Cultures, or the HKVA, and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science that was called, as you see here, Mississippi and Anthropocene River, and that started in 2019. It's been ongoing. It included um, a river journey in Voyager canoes from the mouth of the river to its delta, five different field stations, which were scattered up and down the Mississippi, and it concluded in a week-long field research and educational event at the delta of the river in New Orleans that was called the Human Delta. So Deep Time Chicago created field station number four, which is what I'm going to share a bit of today. Our work uh, focused on the political ecology of the confluence area where the Ohio and the Mississippi River meet. The artworks addressed many things, um, river basin control, the history and future of nuclear power, globalized invasive, invasive species, coal industry legacies, and a whole lot more. Uh, these are all ways of uncovering the Anthropocene condition in that region, essentially how human popula populations have exerted just tremendous powers capable of altering the biosphere. So we thought of our work as that which could bring these histories to light through art. So I'll zoom in even further now on one artwork that I produced collaboratively with a few other artists for the Confluence Ecologies exhibition. Um, it was titled Inheritance, and it was a sound and sculptural installation that took as its subject a 300 million year old fossil forest, which was discovered in the ceiling of coal mines in southern Illinois in that confluence region. Um, we artists were educated about the forest originally from Scott Elric, who is a paleogeologist from UIUC, who we had been in communication with over other things. Uh, what it is, is an entire for forest that has been locked into sediment under southern Illinois during a rapid warming event. And the only people who have witnessed or touched this forest were scientists like Scott and coal miners. So the backstory, a swampy carboniferous forest like this one uh, in the picture straddled an ancient river basin, which was called Galatia. There's now a town called Galatia in Southern Illinois. It flowed through um, that area 300 million years ago. And, and the river interestingly was very similar according to the um, geologic record to the Mississippi in scale. And the peat soil from which the trees grew became exactly the coal seams of the Illinois basin. And the forest was rap rapidly covered over by fluvial sentiments during, as I was saying, during a warming period that's not entirely dissimilar to the one we're experiencing now. Ironically, the, sym the symmetry of this would not have been discovered without the extractionist practices that are causing the warming of today. So the artwork, black screen for a moment, um, as I set the stage, was um, an installation. So it was comprised of two rooms. The first was a lightless room, so very, very difficult to see. There was no light in there. It was filled with the scent of petrichor, or like earth, uh, where the audience would sit for about 24 minutes to listen to an audio work of the voices of local miners and geologists. The second room, which you'll see in a moment, um, was a sculptural installation and text work. So right now I'm going to share with you a two minute excerpt of the audio and uh, that you would hear in this darkened room. 
So everyone involved in the making of this felt a really, a, a great sense of humility and connection with one another as we currently face this human crisis, which is of course our dependency on fossil fuels adjacent to the devastating effects of our practices. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll drop a link for the longer version of this talk, the full 24 minutes, but for now we'll just listen to an excerpt. And please let me know if it's hard to hear. I was on a roof bolter the first time that I saw, it was a leaf that I saw and I, it, it was just different. And the guy that I'd been pinning with and had been bolting for 20, 25 years. And he was like, oh, that's just a leaf. But I had to stop and look at it. It wasn't just a leaf to me. What do you mean it's a leaf five or 600 feet underground? You know, I mean, that's not, leaves grow on trees. They don't grow five or 600 feet underground. So, you know, I had to stop and it, it turned out to be a fern leaf. That's about the only leaf you ever saw underground was a fern. But, uh, you know, it was nothing to him because he'd been doing it so long. But to me, it was, it was exciting. I needed to look at it. I wanted to see what it was. And production, you, you couldn't stop to look. You just had to put a bolt in it and go on. You go down below, they give you a stretch, the boss does, and he says, I hope you can get it done, you know, for the next shift, because I have to turn in that that section is done. And usually they'd have another person with me. So one gets on one side of it, one gets on the other, and you just shovel as much as you can. You learn how much you put on there that you can throw it up there. Just keep after it. Um, you could see fossils like like four foot wide trees just just going down the going down the uh yeah they would they would be in the roof um and the coal had, had managed to fall out so you could see a, a huge chunk of tree here and then um there would be like some coal that had stuck to it and and but it would appear down there and it would appear down there and appear down oh, 40 50 60 feet I'd like to think that there's another industry that could employ as, it's got to employ as many people as you put out of work. Otherwise, you know, what, what does it do? I mean, you, you can't just go green and not employ anybody and it's got to pay as good as what the mines do. You know, you can talk natural gas, you can talk solar panels, but if it, if it doesn't provide for your community, what good is it you know i mean people still have to have an income um from what i know about what happened on easter island i don't think we have a chance in hell of getting through this <laughs> <laughs> they used all the wood and they could no longer fish no they used all the wood they didn't have any boats mm -hmm. and the religion got really um mean uh, as people got more distance. Okay, so those were all voices of the of the about fifteen miners that we interviewed, and the longer um, audio. Well, you can hear you can hear all of them. So at this point, visitors passed through the dark room and then entered a room with this floating table set with about with three hundred million year old fossils that had been collected by the miners as, as souvenirs. So at, as they did their interviews with us, they loaned us these, these fossils. Uh, they were placed atop these you know, traditional silver trays that is a real common form, which I'm sure you've seen. It's part of a, a sort of um, you know, family history, pass these down in the family. And, and they share patterns of the natural world that are real similar to the patterns you see in the fossils. Uh, we found it striking and continue that it took 100 million years to sequester the coal that lies under southern Illinois, and it took a mere 200 years through the labor of thousands of coal miners to extract the carbon that fuels our lifestyle. And coal miners are the first to personally experience the cost of the industry through their bodies. Nearly every single coal miner that we interviewed experienced some significant health issue, whether it be black lung or other lung related issues or a back injury, knee injuries. So these are the fossils on the table. You can see the pattern patterns being mimicked here. These have all been returned to the miners. 
Across the space and at the exit of the room was a text piece that hung on the wall. Uh, it was fashioned sort of in the form of a last will and testament of the forest. I, the vast forest and swamp of Pangaea in what is now Southern Illinois, being 300 million years of age and being of sound body and mind, however decayed, compressed and fossilized, do hereby bequeath the carbon of my remains, my leaves, scales, spores, lignin and cellulose, including insectivora, fungal and bacterial co-inhabitants and relations to the earth and to all species to be buried in perpetuity so that all life may continue to enjoy the atmosphere to which life has evolved. So I'm gonna actually pop over the next couple of images. I am taking even longer than when I practiced. So I'm gonna go down to, um, these were events that took place as part of that weekend. You can kind of get a sense. We did some walking through the landscape. Um, this person here is Scott Elric, who I mentioned earlier. He took us on a walk about it, which is a, a tradition of the Deep Time Chicago Collective. Um, through this area that sort of told the story of this geologic story. Um, he explained that atmospheric CO2 traces over time appear like an EKG with regular predictable spikes and falls. Um, that is until what we call the geologic recent. And on the far right side of the undulating line, which you might have seen at the bottom of our last will and testament, is, is the Keeling curve. Uh, where you see carbon in the atmosphere soaring past the Earth's historic high point of 20, 250 points per million up to the 418 parts per million of today. So we observe this contemporary living forest growing from, from these ancient strata, um, which provided for us um, geologic evidence of, of the warming related flood 300 million years ago while trying to take in this incomprehensible the meaning of this Keeling curve in our as our current temperatures rise. And so we were thinking, of course, is it possible that this very forest will one day be locked in stone to tell our contemporary story? So we held many events through the weekend. I'm just gonna scan some Im images of what Field Station 4 was like. Um, river demonstration on the natural flows of the river, a uh, day-long field trip at Heron Pond. This is in addition to the two exhibitions and a closing event at Fort Defiance Park at the um, massive and bar barge-laden fork of the Ohio and the Mississippi River. Um, and there was a performance with a melody sung over the, it was such a beautiful, crazy scene over the barges in the river and over the town of Cairo, uh, sort of singing about the future flood, the imagined future flood. Um, and I'm going to stop there, but do want to say that um, later, about a few weeks later, we convened in, um, in New Orleans to do this seminar sort of conversation with lots of exploration. And, um, there was one juxtaposition that I just that I that I do want to share because I think it's really poignant and then I'll stop. Um, so you see here the same section of the Mississippi River from Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge to New Orleans. The archival image that you see at the top represents the hundreds of 19th century plantations that flanked the river delta. So all of those little squares. The plantations themselves choked the river's nat natural seasonal pulse and, and its meander, but it also drove, of course, the horrific legacy of the enslavement of African people for labor. And the map at the bottom depicts the region now referred to as Cancer Alley. This is the land, um, the, so the lands occupied by plantation owners are exactly the same land that now drive the petrochemical industry in that region. So this land, once stolen, has has affected the same communities, which is basically poor people of color since the time of colonization. So the, the Mississippi conveners as part of this project have continued to organize exhibitions along the river. And, and so that's the way that this project has continued. And I have just recently with other members of Deep Time Chicago and indigenous groups along the river, um, started a campaign that will both metaphorically and literally argue for the, the personhood rights of the Mississippi River. So stay tuned for that as it as it comes. And then this is just a quick picture of your Mississippi watershed. It's not small.
Okay, stop sharing. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Nika to lead a, a quick reflection, um, and Dwight is going to be getting the word cloud together. Thank you, everybody, for putting those great words in the chat and for following along. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Look at those words. Uh, cool. Okay, yeah, so I guess I'm going to lead a, lead a discussion. I can't see the word cloud. Am I supposed to look somewhere to see it, or is it going to come up on the screen? Dwight will share it as soon as he gets it right. um, okay, gets it together. It might take him a minute or two. Uh, thank you for that, Sarah. That was amazing. I was jotting down a few um, things that stuck out to me in addition to the words that I threw in the chat. Um, something that really kind of like stands out to me is that you worked really closely with uh, coal miners and folks that I think many of us sitting here might not consider our political allies, so to speak, right? I know that um, often we think of uh, coal miners, West Virginia, etc., as being sort of a conservative place. So it's really uh, great and cool to see you sort of engaging in that way about a common sort of shared um, enemy or shared anxiety, which is sort of climate change and and human extraction of fossil fuels, um, destroying the environment, etc. And if we look over the word cloud that um, <clears throat> Dwight just posted, I think the I think coal, human, Anthropocene, fossil, these things resonated with lots of people, so I'm not alone in that. Um, also, I see extraction a bunch of times on there, um, deep, human, Anthropocene, um, and those sorts of things, and, and connection, and I think connection and extraction really stand out to me too, because you mentioned uh, Cancer Alley, which formerly was um, sort of plantation uh, row, or I forget exactly the word that you used, and um, I often teach this in my classes, that sort of our current form of capitalism that has kind of caused a lot of the climate catastrophe, a lot of the climate crisis, um, can be directly tra traced back to two things, which is the enslavement of, of Black folks and um, also the extraction of fossil fuels and our addiction and dependence on it. So it's really interesting to see that overlap and it's, and it's really, um, I think, en enlightening to a lot of us watching this. And I think Ali on there kind of represents um, that as well. Let's see what else we have here, Mississippi. Um, Delta. Yeah, so I think a lot of the stuff that, um, that, that, you know, stuck out to folks uh, uh, seems to be this, the, the things that I was just, just chatting about. So yeah, thank you for that. What a cool um, project. I, I am very, um, yeah, very grateful that you shared that with us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, it really, it really makes you reconsider time and what, what our concept of time is. All right, so we're going to turn it over to Colin next um, to give a little bit about his work, and we'll do the same thing. So please put any words um, that come up for you while you're hearing Colin talk and listen, listening to his work, um, and we'll do another word cloud at the end of this one. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. So as I said earlier, I'm a percussionist. And in the last few years of my PhD, my PhD is really centered on music technology and the steel pan, which is an instrument from Trinidad and Tobago. Most people probably know it is. Um, if my filter doesn't block it out, here's one of mine um, as the steel drum from the Caribbean. It's often associated with Jamaica, even though it's not really, doesn't have much to, it's not very present in that country, like it sounds like this. And so um, I fell in love with that instrument when I was in music school. It doesn't go away. And so recently I've been doing acoustical studies of it and um, designing audio effects that are work well with its particular acoustic properties. And so that led me to a project with a composer named Matthew Bertner, who teaches at University of Virginia. And so for a different type of steel pan, so that one I just played was called a lead pan. 
which is the highest voiced pan. And then uh, they go all the way down to base pans, which are made out of six full oil barrels. So I'll talk about the oil connection in a moment. But um, so this piece that I did is for what are called double tenors. So it's two pans together and I'll, you'll see that in a video um, that and electronics based on a concept that I came up with. So the history of the steel pan is that it was invented, um, it, it really came out of slavery in Trinidad. So in the late 1800s, the British colonial government banned all drums because they're, um, they didn't like it. They thought that the, uh, the black former slaves in Trinidad could use them to communicate with each other and form an uprising. And so they, they banned all the drums, but the drums were really important for Trinidadian um, the carnival for their celebrations every year. And so what they started doing was they started taking random objects and just they still form the parades, they formed their bands, but they would start hitting random objects. So some of those objects were like little cookie tins, the very thin um, tin, and you hit it and eventually it gets dented. And eventually those dents take on, might take on a specific shape where it starts to make a, a pitched sound. And so, and that is the origin of the invention of the steel pan. So they eventually started doing that on purpose. And then you know, they just kept getting bigger and they'd start off with just two notes, like notes. They weren't tuned the way we would think of it as being tuned, right? It's very organic. And so as it grew, they would start adding more and more notes and they started learning how to tune them to specific pitches and get, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, have a low and a high. And eventually they started tuning it like, you know, to all the notes we have on the piano. So we have all 12 chromatic notes. But the real breakthrough in the production and the development of the steel pan was when they started making them out of oil barrels that were discarded after World War II where Trinidad was the staging ground for the British and American navies. And so after the war, there were probably just thousands, literally thousands of these uh, discarded oil barrels, oil drums, just on the beaches and whatnot in Trinidad. And it's a large metal area. What they do is they take it, they cut off the bottom, they take the top, the round part, they sink it down, and then they hammer it back up to make these little bubbles. And each of those bubbles is a note. And so, uh, and to this day, oil, uh, steel pans are still made out of oil oil barrels. Um, many, like my my very nice ones, are custom made, so they're not made from ones that um, used to hold oil. But this one, um, I mean, I don't know if it actually held oil or not. Uh, maybe if I turn off my filter, um, how do I get rid of that? So this one, let's see if the camera can pick it up. Um, no, the camera's not gonna get it, but inside of it, you can actually see the stampings from where the uh, where it was labeled with the size of the barrel, what was in it, those kinds of things, like stamped into the metal before it was pushed down and then each of those bubbles is a note like that. And so the this connection inspired me to approach my friend Matthew, who's a wonderful composer, um, to create this piece. And so we we made this piece using, uh, he wrote the music, I came up with the, the concept and provided a lot of the uh, sounds for the electronics. I am going to share my screen now and show the correct one. Um, let's do that. All right, oh, it goes in. There we go. Can you see this? Um, yeah. Excellent. So this is a close up of what we did was we took this, we borrowed <laughs> this uh, beat up uh, steel, steel drum from a construction site. And you can see all these, all of these things are microphones. So these are contact microphones. These are actual microphones. And there are seven microphones set up um, to capture the sounds of these, of just taps and uh, attacks on it. Uh, this is a close up image of it. And so we used samples from this and samples from my own um, steel pans, which uh, like I said, are a different type than the one I just picked up. 
and uh, we created this piece, which is about 10 minutes long. This is me, a photo of me in the studio recording it. And so the name of the piece is Oil Drum. Um, and the, so what it, and what it does is it examines the connection between oil and the steel pan. And so it does this by sonifying oil production data, for example, in Trinidad, which is a heavy oil producer, um, and as well as Alaska, which is where Matthew is from. So Matthew grew up in Alaska and actually would be on oil barrels in Alaska that are just discarded in the tundra and uh, make music that way when he was a kid. And so a lot of his music now connects to that. He has an entire album. Um, he has many albums exploring what he calls uh, eco-acoustic music and um, pieces that uh, use melt, you know, use sound samples from melting glaciers, and he's recorded the inside of a volcano before and melted a microphone in order to do so, and all sorts of wild things. So it was really exciting to collaborate with him on this piece. And so I and then I performed the premiere of this piece in March. Ironically, I recorded it last December because that's what I could do. And then uh, since I haven't this this performance in March was my first performance in about two years. Um, so it was really nice to be on stage again. So this was my PhD recital. And I was going to show you the first few minutes of the piece. And so you'll hear here behind. So these are my steel pans. These are double tenors, so double meaning two pans. And then behind here is a brake drum from a car. And so you'll hear that um, when I start striking, it'll be it'll sound very different. And on that, based on the vent volume and the tempo, it's uh, reflecting the um, with the uh, oil production data, but also then the sounds will be coming from a lot of pre-rendered um, processed sounds from my steel pans, from the beat up oil uh, steel barrel that we were uh, recording, as well as um, just sounds that Matthew made on his electronic musical toys. And it's it sounds really neat. And so this is Oil Drum by Matthew Berner or at least an excerpt thereof.
All right. And so I think that is a great place to pause that. And so now, I, this year, this summer, as I mentioned, I am the uh, artist in residence for Oceanworks Canada. So based on that piece um, uh, included in my application to be the artist in residence, I am working with the ocean scientists there at ONC to um, developing several new works that are looking um, specifically, one topic is the connection between the oil and the oceans, whereas that was just oil in the steel pan. Um, so there's that you know, obvious progression, as well as uh, it's been really in inspiring to connect with the uh, acousticians and oceanographers and, you know, whatever other fields in that area that I don't even understand really fully um, to learn about what they do at ONC. And uh, I've got a little list of pieces that I'm working on now that are depicting different issues surrounding the ocean and, um, some of the issue, some of the problems with it, some of the hopeful solutions, and then tying it all together in a bow with the uh, overarching topic of oil and water. So uh, I think that's uh, a good stopping point for me, and we can move on to the next part of the uh, webinar. Thank you, Colin. Um, it was really, really awesome to hear the history of the steel pan and how that's connected. Um, and I, I see a lot of connections in the chat. Uh, we'll get the, the word cloud up shortly, yeah. but I anticipate that that will probably be one of the ones that goes to the top. Um, but really, I think it's, it's interesting how you are taking a concept and, 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 and introducing it to people in a different way. Um, and and it, I think it really makes people say, wait a second, like, what is this? What is behind this? What are we seeing? What are we hearing? What does that mean? And it, it, it really, I think, is a wonderful medium for connecting with people. So yes, here we're seeing a lot about oil. Trinidad, as you mentioned, a lot of times um, the ocean connection at the end you were talking about the bubbles and how they actually make the notes on the steel pan. And all of that is really good. And hope hope came up too a bit, um, especially when we were listening to your piece. Um, there was the alarm at first, but then connection and hope, um, which is really, really wonderful. So thank you. Um, in the interest of time, um, we're gonna move on to discuss a little bit more. Um, so I invite anybody in the audience to submit your questions for either Colin or Sarah in the chat, um, and we can um, get to those in a second. But first, uh, we are going to have Sarah ask Colin a question, and then Colin ask Sarah a question. So uh, while we do that, please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. So. Um, Sarah, yes. first. Colin, Colin, thank you. It was so amazing to listen to your work. My gosh, it was very powerful. Um, thank you. So yeah, really incredible. I can't wait to see it live. So keep us posted. <laughs> um, so the question that I was thinking about and that you and I talked a little bit about is um, oftentimes when we're making work about various political crises or ecological scenarios or whatever it is in the world, right? Like one of the kind of uh, perhaps the cliches or perhaps like perfectly appropriate sort of descriptions of an artist is that, that we sort of take things in from the world and then, and then, um, and then represent them in various ways. And um, translatability is, is often a difficulty, right? So, so there's a lot of abstraction. Mika mentioned that term early on. And uh, we're all pretty darn good at abstraction, but it also causes some problems in the arts, right, where uh, it can sometimes lead to um, an audience feeling a bit uh, perhaps lost or, or, or like that the translation is not that clear and, and, and music, especially the form that you're using where you don't have, you know, lyrics that say this, this and that, right. Um, but rather perhaps a title and like the material of your, of your instrument, um, that's subtle. How do you, um, 
I guess I just want to know a little bit about uh, what what concerns you around that. How do you address that like possible problem or opportunity in your work? I'm kind of curious to hear a little bit about that when you're working with such pointed kind of um, you know pointed subject matter. Right, right, right. Yeah. So this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately, in particular, because. Um, Prior to these projects, I've been doing a lot of what we call just um, pure music, or um, instead of programmatic music. So programmatic music has a is trying to depict something in real life, whereas like pure music is just um, mm. it's just audio, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that it can sound very nice and pretty, but so with programmatic music, you have to think about. I'm like, well, what is what does water sound like? You know, we have we can use audio samples, and I do use that. But like, what does oil sound like? But now I'm thinking about okay, what does it sound like for in musically sound like for the ocean to um, be the pH level of the ocean to be changing? What does yeah. it sound like? What does deoxygenation of the ocean sound like? And that's the way 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 I I like to do it is we kind of or at least I do, <laughs> I'm tending to right now is rely a little bit on program notes so we write up a little bit or just vocal ones explain a little bit of what's going on mm -hmm. and I like to just kind of prime the audience with just enough to say like this is what I'm going for and then want them to come up with their own reactions to it because I, I don't want I don't like to to say that this is what it is mm -hmm. and that you should think what I I think but that I want them to have their own organic uh, reactions to it so they can go in all these different directions and interpret it in different ways because mm. um, I find that really exciting and often I, their interpretations are probably much more profound than mine would be. Mm. Um, so I like to kind of to do that. To, it's like a priming effect. Like if, if I didn't tell you about the banging being um, the production data, there's no real way to know that. Mm. Uh, and so in many ways, I'm often jealous of visual artists where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, there's all these cues that um, you can use. And mm -hmm. so I try to do that as well, but use that, that priming technique to, um, to give a little context to it. And so I was actually going to ask you, well, originally I was going to ask you a little bit about something you, you actually addressed in your talks. And now I, I, oh, crossing no. <laughs> <laughs> I was crossing my question off, but what I really like about visual art is that you can and we can do this with sound too but with visual art like you can really take these objects from different contexts where we we cult either culturally uh, understand it or it's just you know something an object that you re you recognize and then when you combine them in a new way um, it changes it forces this um, so, sort of a little bit of a of tension between them and resolving that. So I was specifically thinking about the, the sort of the platters, the silver platters and mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. uh, the um, rock leaves. I for, yeah, I the, I yeah the fossils, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that really moving. Mm -hmm. And then um, mm -hmm. how um, there's lots, lots of different ways to kind of think about that. Cause I was looking, you know, I was looking at the project beforehand and mm -hmm. how um how it looks like you know is i was thinking it's like oh is this what is the significance of this without reading you know mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a dissertation on the project mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so there's so many different thoughts that you can can come to mind and so yeah for you in some ways i have an i have a easy way out because i can just take a concept and try to portray it but you have much more specific abstractions where you have the silver platters which that's really hard to convey in music, but so how do you choose mm -hmm. what different objects to smash yeah. together and create something yeah. new with? Yeah, such a, such a rich question. Um, I mean, you know, the artistic process is an interesting one. Um, it's a sort of, I we sort of joke, I mean, I work collaboratively, so I, I have this wonderful opportunity to sort of like dialogue and explore with another person or persons. Uh, which a lot of people who work as an individual artist, uh, they don't they don't have it quite as directly as that. But but what you really can do is sort of collaborate with your work, which means that that you will make a gesture like so something comes to mind. Right. Like it. And, and we'll use the example of the platters and the fossils. Right. Um, 
we were thinking a lot about kind of the legacy of mining and, and also um, the way in which this fossil forest told us a story, right? Through deep time, it told a story. And um, that story runs parallel. Like, so, so the geologic story that was happening uh, underground was running parallel to this very human sort of industrial story, but also like we really wanted to highlight or bring out the lives of the humans that are impacted by these industrial processes, these processes of extraction and, and not um, sort of create the problematic um, us versus them sort of political mentality that has us kind of in a deeper crisis, right? Where we can't seem to move forward because we're saying, you know, we're, we're, we're in a gridlock, right? And so when we spoke with the miners, of course, we understood that like, mining is a, is a family uh, tradition. It, it means way more to them than simply, you know, um, pulling fossil fuels out of the, the ground to, to burn them and create climate change, right? Like that's, not, that's, an, that's a, a very incomplete story for them. And so the, the way that we pass down these like um, silver platters, for example, and, and in fact, all of them came from people that were part of the collaboration, right? That they're in their families. Uh, what we saw like, oh, wow, interesting. So this kind of represents, almost symbolizes inheritance. And, as a concept, and then we set them next to the to the story that this geologic story, this biological story, and saw that they actually kind of mirrored one another. And it was kind of a tr it was kind of an accident, right? Like we we saw that juxtaposition, and we're like, wow, that's that is that is an enrichment of this story. And you know, but but truthfully, we tried we tried many different things, and and including the sound juxtapositions, right? So when we had all these miners' voices and ideas and stories and, and including the geologists, we had to weave them together. And, and it was a it was truly just like in any artistic process, probably very much like when you're making music, you know, you have to decide what's going to come after, what's going to come before, and you move it around a lot. So there was so much editing that took place in in all of it. Um, that it really is, it's it's a collaboration with the work itself. Very nice. I was thinking of the uh, the fossilized leaves as like almost like delicacies of, of natural history that are being yes, you know, right? presented on the platters. Yes, presented right to us. It's like here here we have to inherit this circumstance. You know, Very what nice. are we going to do with it? Well, this has been uh, wonderful to hear you guys um, talk about your work a bit more. Unfortunately, we are very close to the end of the hour, and um, I just wanted to give another plug for our open, um, uh, well, first of all, that we have other uh, dialogues coming up, um, and uh, Julie may want to say a, a, a few words about that, but before I turn it over to her, um, please, if you are interested in being part of our virtual exhibit at AGU, um, fill out the form, reach out to me. We would love to, to have a showcase your work or your project, and, the, and that's due August 5th. Um, so Julie, did you want to take um, a minute to talk a little bit more about the next steps for the dialogues? I would just say the first thank you. Thank you to the art and science team. This was amazing. And I posted in the chat a list of upcoming dialogues that will be about science policy. They'll be about social and behavioral sciences, community and citizen sciences, and science communication. So I hope you can join us. And thank you all so much for, for putting together this, like such a great experience. It, this really was a great way of, learning about art and science. So thank you. Thank you all for attending and a major thank you for Colin and Sarah. Well, we really thank appreciate you. It sharing. <laughs> it was so much fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. And I do think that um, there will we, we do have a short survey evaluation form just to make sure that um, to get people's feedback about this event and if we want to continue doing it. Um, and Brendan, just put it in the chat if you could fill that out um, before, before you um, move on to other things for today. Uh, and he'll also email, um, send it around by email to those who participated.
we would really appreciate any feedback that you have about this um, format, uh, topic, all of that. So thank you. And I hope everyone has a good rest of their week.